If there's a piece of writing advice that's given more often and misunderstood and misapplied more often than show don't tell, it's this, write what you know. If this was actually a rule of writing, then the world of literature, film, and culture in general would be about as exciting as watching ice cream melt at one degree Celsius. But just like show don't tell is good writing advice if taken and applied in the right way, so is write what you know. Now obviously if you take it only as write only from your personal experience, then the advice is way too restrictive. If that were the case, then if you haven't done something or had it done to you, you wouldn't be able to write about it. And it would raise serious ethical questions about anyone who's ever written about murder. Like me. If we were writing from personal experience, a lot of us would be in prison. But of course, this isn't the case. John Green didn't need to be a teen with fatal cancer to write The Fault in Our Stars. Before anyone gets on my case about this, I have recently learned about what his brother is going through, and I share my sympathy that I don't follow the Green brothers, so I wrote this before I found that out. But I have read The Fault in Our Stars, and it's really good for what it is, and obviously John Green knows something about teens with terminal cancer. J.R.R. Tolkien didn't need to be a hobbit to write The Lord of the Rings, but he could invent the hobbits and write The Lord of the Rings. And Sophocles hopefully didn't need to kill his father and marry his mother to write Oedipus Rex. So does this mean that we should just ignore write what you know and anything goes? If that were the case, why did writers start giving this advice to begin with? It might be best to look at write what you know as a positive way of framing don't write from ignorance. Now, John Green may have never been a teen with terminal cancer, but that wouldn't stop him from researching various types of cancer, understanding support groups, interviewing teens with cancer and their family members. In fact, if he tried writing The Fault in Our Stars without doing any of that legwork, it would have come across false. If he'd just made up all the cancer details out of his own head, it wouldn't have rung true for anyone and would never have become a success. It needed that grounding of real world fact to make its story ring true. And the story needed to ring true to grab and hold its audience. So though John Green wasn't a cancer kid, as far as I know, he clearly did the work necessary to get his audience to suspend their disbelief. So we can see from this example that one way to get over the hurdle of write what you know is to expand the base of your knowledge. In other words, do your research. Research is a crucial skill for writers. Now, John Green writes realism, so it makes sense that he's going to want to get his details accurate. If you're going to write about cancer, you want at least some good working knowledge of cancer. Nothing ruins realism like a statement of fact that's blatantly untrue. If you're writing police procedurals, it would be very helpful for you to know something about how the police operate. If you're writing a medical drama, then you should probably know how hospitals work and what doctors have to do. If you're writing a romance that takes place in farm country, it would behoove you to know a little bit about farming and ideally a bit about romance as well. But what if you're not writing realism? Isn't it impossible to write what you know if you're writing fantasy, sci-fi, or supernatural horror? Not at all. J.R.R. Tolkien may never have met a hobbit, a dwarf, or a dragon. But he was a professional scholar with a deep knowledge of Celtic and Norse history, mythology, and ancient languages, which he could draw on when creating his own magical world, adding depth and substance to that world's culture, history, and languages. Sophocles never met Oedipus, never saw Sphinx, never, we assume, committed patricide or incest. But he could retell a well-known mythological story that would resonate with audiences for hundreds, thousands of years. Andy Weir never went to Mars. But if you've read The Martian, it's clear that he knows a good deal about Mars, biology, and the physics of space travel and the problems of surviving in space. Even the stuff he made up is believable. William Peter Blatty probably never met anyone possessed by a demon, but he clearly knew the signs, the history, the folklore, and the Catholic Church's typical response to demonic possession, or he couldn't have turned The Exorcist into the massive hit it became. Yes, in fiction, it's fine to fudge the facts, 
Your genre and the needs of your story will determine how far you can go with that. How fast and loose you can play with the details without unsuspending your reader's sense of disbelief. So the dictum can be turned around here. Instead of write what you know, think about know what you write. Obviously you have a leg up here if your field of knowledge and your genre of interest intersect. You have a background in engineering and a love for sci-fi, boom. Match made in heaven, you could be the next Robert Heinlein. Have a knack for puzzles and really enjoy detective stories? Well, I can see that going somewhere. Spent time as a foster parent or child and want to write stories about orphans? You might have something to say. But what if you want to write a story with no connection to your own background? Are you screwed then? If you want to write about something that you have no experience of, you just need to do three things. One, research. Two, invent. And three, and this is the most important part, believe in your story world. Step one should be obvious. If you want to write about something that you don't know anything about, you need more knowledge. Go on the internet, go in the library, talk to people, expand your view of the world. It's part of the writer's job. Step two is about stretching the truth or making the facts up as need be. Since this is the core of what we do as fictional storytellers, this step should be our bread and butter. Again, your genre and the aims of your story will determine just how much you can get away with inventing the facts. Just make sure, while you are inventing, to keep your facts consistent. If you're inventing a place, don't change its name every time you refer to it. Step three is about commitment. It's all about internal consistency. You have to craft a world and a story that feels real enough for you to believe in it. No matter how fantastical your story world, if you don't fully buy into it, your reader never will. But if you commit to your story world, if you believe in it with all your being, if you know more about the events, characters, and settings of your story world than you could ever possibly communicate on paper, then that passion has a good chance to bleed through and infect the reader as well. Now, if this last step feels a little too woo-woo for you, consider the inverse. If you don't fully believe in your story world, if it doesn't feel real to you, your reader is never going to buy it. I hope this helps you think about your approach to writing. So keep in mind, you don't have to restrict yourself to write only what you know. That would be absurd. As long as you commit yourself to knowing what you write. Very zen, I know. Thanks for watching, guys. I appreciate all you guys. 700 subscribers, that's awesome. My heart just races every time I think about that. Thank you for sticking with my inconsistent upload schedule and everything. I've got more cool videos coming up. There's plenty of scripts in the template, several collaborations planned down the pipeline, not too far away. So please keep enjoying the videos. Put a comment down below and then like the video, subscribe to the channel, share it with all your friends, and let's keep the world of great storytelling growing. And until next time, good luck and good writing. Peace.